Well, good evening to you, and let me start, as always, by welcoming you very warmly to our worship of God here this Sunday evening at Gilcomson Church. Especially those of you who are visiting tonight, we're delighted to welcome you in Christ's name. It's always good for us to be reminded of the spread of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ and to unite together with those from different uh, churches, different uh, Uh, nationalities as well. Lovely to have you all with us. Lovely to welcome those of you joining us online as well, wherever you may be, uh, and whatever your circumstances. A warm welcome to you. We do trust and pray always that you will know God's very real blessing and encouragement as you share with us in this way. Let's then join with one another to worship God in words that are taken from one of the Psalms, from Psalm 34, through all the changing scenes of life. Let us join together to worship God. Bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Living God, how wonderful a privilege it is that you afford to us through the grace of your Son and thus being able to gather together in his name and draw near to yourself and even as we lift our voices in praise to discover afresh that in the mystery of your kind mercy, you are pleased to inhabit the praise of your people and to intimate to our hearts by your Holy Spirit your presence with us, your care for us, and the constancy of that love that enables us in the midst of whatever trials and troubles we may have to face 
to know that you will indeed sustain us through them as the God who daily bears our burdens and you will indeed bring us safely to our desired haven. And we rejoice, therefore, to sound out your praise, to lift our voices to you together, and in so doing, to encourage one another in the wonder of your own goodness towards us in the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. How worthy you are, our gracious God, of our praise. How altogether wise you are in all your dealings, in all your ways, your ways we acknowledge humbly, our Father, are not our ways. They are infinitely higher ways than ours, and therefore there are those times when we find them confusing. We do not see the end of things from the very beginning as you do, and in the midst of such darkness and such perplexity, we are constrained simply to trust you. And we're glad that you have given to us such ample testimony that enables us to know that you are altogether trustworthy. Not only are you so wise, but you are always so good from the very outset of the scriptures. You underline that, that it was good, it was good, it was good. And we rejoice that nothing that you plan, nothing you say, nothing you do is ever anything other than perfectly good. We rejoice in that knowledge. We thank you for that good purpose that you have formed altogether good beyond our capacity fully to comprehend or describe that purpose whereby you have reached down into the squalor of our waywardness and sin and been pleased in the person of your son to effect for all who trust in him no matter who we are, what our background is, what our our baggage is to effect for us that which secures our truest lasting welfare, our salvation. And we praise you that such has been the measure of your own grace towards us, that you've been pleased not only to grant us in your Son a new start, but to come by your Holy Spirit into our lives and to transform us from within in such a way that ultimately, transformed from one degree of glory to another, we shall at the last be conformed finally to the perfect image and likeness of your own beloved Son. How altogether glorious you are, and how we thank you that you combine every circumstance in our lives to that end in your own matchless sovereign power. We marvel at that, living God, and rest in the confidence that flows from the knowledge that you are absolutely sovereign, and that it is sovereign grace that is ministered to us in such a way that your purposes for us in Christ are indeed assured to us, and we rejoice in that knowledge and are glad, therefore, to offer ourselves in worship once again to you and ask simply that you would take us and use us in your service. We pray that as we gather thus this evening and open our hearts and our voices to you in praise so you would draw near to us, and by your Holy Spirit, through your own holy word, would you speak into our hearts and lives in a way that will be transforming, in a way that will be strengthening, in a way that will match the resources of your grace to the needs of our hearts at this time. Grant us then your blessing and your help in our worship this night as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we are going to turn to the scriptures now, and we'll have the words on the screen if you want to follow there. Mike is going to come and read for us from uh, uh, the book of Ruth. Good evening. Um, as Jerry said, we're looking at the book of Ruth tonight, chapter 1. You'll find that on page 267 of the Church Bibles. Um, Ruth, chapter 1 starting to read at verse 6. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, 
each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Amen. Well, before we turn back to the scripture tonight, we're, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing a hymn that um, gives expressions to the, the uh, faith that is involved for us at times when life is hard. Sometimes it is hard. And we're going to sing the hymn, My Times Are In Thy Hand.
Well, we turn to the uh, book of Ruth this evening, just uh, these verses to start with in chapter one. Uh, girls and boys, you'll have a, a worksheet available that uh, also runs through the material there uh, that we're going to be looking at. Quite an important passage, and I hope that uh, having the opportunity for you to work through the worksheet enables you then to, to kind of chat it through with your parents afterwards and uh, see how that applies to your lives, to their lives, and to our lives. And it's a, it's a very instructive narrative. The reason for our um, starting with the, the book of Ruth here tonight uh, is really because in coming weeks, uh, I hope that we will get on to look at First Samuel. Last Sunday evening, we were thinking about uh, Simeon and Anna as an integral part of the, the story that Luke narrates in regard to the birth of Jesus. He kind of rounds off the birth narrative by reference to these two older individuals who exercise essentially a prophetic ministry. Anna is described as a prophetess, and Simeon, in the way in which he ministers to uh, Joseph and Mary, uh, is exercising essentially the ministry of a prophet. And one of the reasons why Luke does that is because in his companion volume, The Acts of the Apostles, which records the, the story of the early church, he means from the outset us to understand that the call of the Christian church, the call upon disciples now, is to be a prophetic people, to exercise that sort of prophetic ministry. And you remember on the day of Pentecost, uh, Peter quotes from the prophet Joel, and rather naughtily, he adds in uh, a line that is naturally in there in Joel, um, at least not the second time around. Joel does say they will prophesy, and Peter adds it in a second time as if to underline the fact that's what the church will now do. They will exercise that prophetic ministry. And integral to that, obviously, is the, the responsibility that the Christian church has of simply releasing the word of God, because that's what the, the prophets did. They released the word of God. And uh, very often we think of the prophets as being those who predicted the future, but in reality, what they, they really are doing is they, they determine the future because they bring the word of God, and the word of God is what is transforming. And as the, the word of God is released, so the future is shaped. And that's what the early church then begins to do. They simply release the word and some extraordinary things begin to happen as God, through his word, changes the whole landscape of the ancient world and has continued to do that right on down to the present day so that to this day the church is growing, is expanding in uh, different parts of the world in quite remarkable ways. And in the, the, um, the scriptures, there is, I, I think, no fuller treatment given of the, the way in which the Word of God shapes and determines and transforms the future than in the book that bears the name of Samuel. Uh, he was a prophet. Um, he's not one of the ones that's flagged up as, as a prophet, but he exercises a prophetic ministry. He is bringing the Word of God and seeing that Word of God applied to his day and generation, and in so doing becomes instrumental in bringing about what in some ways is the most remarkable turnaround in the story of the people of God that the Old Testament has from uh, a, a very, very desperate scenario where they were a wayward people uh, going effectively down the tubes to being a people uh, respected and uh, uh, admired across the face of the globe so that uh, people were drawn to Jerusalem to see what it was that was going on, to, to see something of what this God actually did among and in the lives of his people. And uh, the, the, the role that Samuel plays in turning things around is, is a pivotal role, and the book of Samuel is therefore a very instructive book for us. What we often fail to recognize, though, is that the, uh, the story of that remarkable turnaround, the story of that transformation of a society, actually begins earlier than Samuel. And it begins, really, in the book of Ruth. And it begins not with the lady whose name uh, that book bears, namely Ruth, but it actually begins with uh, this lady, Naomi. 
in some ways, she becomes the pivotal player. Uh, very unheralded. Um, she doesn't even get a book named after her. But in many ways, it is her through whom the Lord begins to effect this remarkable change that in later years will become evident and we were able to look back and see, wow, what, what a remarkable turnaround there was. And so we're, we're going to look this evening at the, the story of Naomi and hopefully learn some lessons from that. And I hope that as we do so, uh, you'll be aware of the Lord speaking into your situation as an individual in the same way as I trust he speaks into our situation as his people in our land in these days. And that becomes evident the moment we look at the background to this lady, Naomi. That's where we'll start this evening with her background. And... Um, I, I think it's important for us simply to, to get some feel for, first of all, the times in which she lived. She lived in the times of the judges. If you turn back to uh, the, the very opening verse of the book of Ruth in the days when the judges ruled. Let me bring the next slide up so you can see the, the, uh, the way that we're going to go here. The times in which she lived uh, were the times of the judges. Uh, there's a whole book that bears the name of the judges. And the book of Judges really charts the decline of the, uh, the people of Israel. And I see what uh, we've put up on the screen now is, um, is a, a, a psalm that over the years, and I suppose over 50 years now anyway, has, has really been a, a hugely powerful psalm so far as I've been concerned. Psalm 126, because in some ways I think uh, the, the narrative of the book of Ruth really explains and provides a picture of what actually this psalm translates to. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Now, it is, in some ways, um, an illustration of what that psalm is underlining for us at its close, that um, the, the story of Naomi presents itself to us. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, will return with shouts of joy, bringing sheaves with them. In other words, there will be a harvest. And it's very striking at the end of this chapter that as, as Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem, it is at the time when the barley harvest is beginning. Something is happening. And uh, that's something that is happening on the, the very material uh, realm with the, the harvest that is starting. Uh, we're meant to understand actually something much, much bigger than that is beginning to happen. There is a harvest, a massive harvest that is going to be reaped down through the years, down through the generations beyond Naomi. Uh, but as she comes back, uh, having um, wept and having sown in uh, her weeping the, the seed, uh, there will be a harvest. And you and I are meant to understand that and to view the, the story of Naomi in that light. Uh, when Naomi died, I guess if you'd asked her on her deathbed, you know, what's life been like for you? She probably would have said, actually, it's been pretty miserable. And the best that I can say is, is I've been a survivor. The conclusion to which we can come that it's pretty ordinary, pretty mixed up, pretty messed up sometimes, and, and sometimes just being tough. And that's been the story of our lives, just being tough, and, and we see no real fruit from it at all. And the Lord underlines, you, you do need to read to the end of the story. You do need to see how it all plays out down the line. 
And so we're, we're going to look at Naomi and try and learn a little bit from her. She lived, as I say, in the times of the judges. That's part of her background. The time in which she lived was the time of the judges. Um, you don't need me to remind you what that time was like. Um, at the end of the book of Judges, uh, a couple of times over, it's underlined in Israel, there was no king. Everyone did as they saw fit in their own eyes. It was anarchy, basically. And um, they, they might have thought that it was freedom, but it wasn't really freedom. It was anarchy. People just did as they, they pleased, very similar to our own society. You are God. You get to choose. No one's going to tell you how to behave. No one's going to rule your life. You get to choose who you are. You get to choose how you behave. You get to choose what the pattern of life is going to be. No one is going to tell me this is right, this is wrong, this is true, this is false. You get to decide because you are God. Our society is very similar now to the society of the book of Judges. And the book of Judges charts the, the decline of that society from the point early on in chapter 2, verse 10, where it said a generation grew up that didn't know the Lord, that hadn't lived through what the Lord had done, had not been uh, accustomed to, not familiar with what the Lord had done. They grew up, and as that generation gave way to the next and to the next, there was this uh, spiraling downward morally, spiritually, and in every other way as well. And um, basic to all that was going on was the, the absence of a ministry of the Word of God. There had been that sort of ministry in the time of Moses. He had taught the people. Uh, sometimes he found he was just tearing his hair out with frustration the way that the people were, but, it, but he taught them and applied the truth to them, and he retaught them and taught them again. And Joshua carried that on and sought to, to bring the truth of God to bear with them. Remember how Joshua is told at the start of the book of Joshua, make sure that you, you have the word of God uh, central to you, that you are meditating on it day and night. You don't swerve from that. Make that the the compass for all your living and for the living of your people. But a generation grew up that, that knew nothing of the Lord, knew nothing of his word, and uh, there was this spiraling downwards to this point where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the latter part of the book of Judges, um, you really have to be above a certain age to be allowed to read it. It is, it is so seamy and dark and sordid. Those were the times in which she lived, and Naomi, in many ways, was simply a child of her time. Um, it would seem that she, she had a faith of some sort, but it was a compromised faith. Her husband is called Elimelech, which simply means uh, God is king. Um, that's, that's who he's called, and that supposedly is, is what he stands for, but it doesn't really look much like the fact that God is king the way he conducts himself. It looks more like uh, Elimelech is king. Elimelech is the one who makes the decisions, and so uh, he, will, he will leave the land that God has, God, the supposed king, has promised. He will give his people a land that is good and spacious, a land that will uh, afford to them the harvest that they need. He will leave that land and try and find uh, a harvest for himself elsewhere, try and find food for himself elsewhere. Uh, he will go to Moab. He will go to a land that uh, is, is not where God has said he will be. He will go there, and in the next uh, uh, generation, um, his rather than the, the, the quality of it or the size of it that is the key thing always in the scripture. Um, it's, it's my faith is, is, is not as, as sharp, not as keen, not as strong, uh, not as resilient as I, I think it probably should be. And, uh, and I wonder, maybe, maybe I'm just kind of dismissed by the Lord as uh, not being able to be used. That's her background anyway. And, and I want from there simply to take you on to the narrative, which is the larger part of what um, Mike read for us uh, in the verses before us, to, to speak about her experience. And it's this that illustrates, I suppose, what tears can be like for the believer. It is... Um, it is a lie of the devil to suggest that when you become a Christian, uh, all your problems are sorted. And he sets you on a path that will be very comfortable, very easy, things will always work out, and you will have a, a kind of very comfortable, happy existence. And this just um, puts the lie on that. Um, it's not like that. We, we go out 
weeping often for all sorts of reasons. And, and that's the manner in which we go out weeping. Um, I, I sometimes think that uh, Psalm 121 is speaking in, in, uh, in a similar vein when towards the end, remember that final verse, the Lord watches over our going out. Uh, and that sometimes is the hard bit and, and also our coming in. And, uh, and here she is, she is going out and she is weeping. And, and this is what tears look like. This is what the life of faith can be like. And the, the scriptures don't draw a veil over that and, and simply try and hide your eyes from that. They, they open it wide and say, yep, that, that's what it's like. Jesus described himself as, as the man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And uh, we follow him. And we follow him and experience what, um, what Naomi here describes as being emptied. Uh, towards the end of that passage there, uh, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And that's a very real part of Christian experience. Not a comfortable part, but we are emptied. We, we often are, are quite full of ourselves, full of our own resources, full of our own capabilities, full of our own gifts, and, and uh, eager to, to make something of ourselves. And and the Lord has to empty us of all that. Otherwise, we are liable to, to boast, at least in some measure, of ourselves and rely in some measure upon ourselves, upon our, our natural gifts, upon our resources, upon our intellect, upon our wealth, our, upon our, our strength, whatever it may be. And the, the Lord simply empties us of all of that so that we may learn to boast only of him and to recognize that he alone is our help and our strength. And I want you to see just with me uh, briefly here uh, in what ways Ruth, uh, Naomi, was emptied. Um, the first way in which she was emptied, the first part of the tears that were hers, um, by and large, I think, is, is overlooked by most people. And, and it's this, she had a sickly child. Uh, her oldest son was called Machlon. That's the one who married Ruth, as we find out later in Ruth chapter 4, verse 10. Um, and back in those days, you, you named your child for good reason, not just because you liked the name, but for a good reason, either because it was descriptive of them or a prediction about them or whatever the reason may be. But there was a, a good reason, almost a kind of prophetic reason why you named a child what you named the child. And this child is called sick or sickness or sickly. You, you don't go around and call your child that as a, as a kind of, that's a nice name to call my child. Um, who are you? You're sick. Uh, you just don't do that. And, and almost certainly the, the reason for this child having been called Marklon was because that's what he was. He was a sickly child. And that's hard for any parent. We, we pray for some within our ken in regard to their children who are sickly, because it is hard, hard for such parents. Uh, and very often, um, it can be that those in ministry particularly, it is their children that are targeted. I want to chat with Susan about that. And the, the, the way in which that particular aspect of our life is is target it because it, it really cuts right to the heart. And, and that's not easy for any parent, and it was no less easy, uh, no more easy for Naomi than for any parent today, a sickly child. And, and I think that's borne out by the fact that when the second child is born, uh, he's called something rather different, Hylion, which means complete or perfect. And uh, that's a kind of household you're growing up and one child sickly and the other, yeah, at last, we've got a, a kind of good son, a son who's healthy and, and well. And uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the perfect deal, the complete one here. Um, that, that seems to be part and parcel of uh, her story. 
So long before the famine ever kicks in, um, there is this, this difficulty, this trouble, this trial that she has in regard to uh, the child that she has born. Uh, and a mother feels that uh, more keenly than any. Uh, that's the child that has grown within her. That's the child that was born from her. That's the child that she has nursed from infancy. Uh, and she's just poured her everything into that child, a, a sickly child, um, hard in the extreme. And then there is the experience of austerity as famine kicks in. Um, we, we, we know little of this. And it's very hard to, to begin to enter into just how difficult that is and how stressful that is when there, there isn't any food. We, we kind of look at the pictures on the television at the minute and, and see these homes that have just been devastated. And uh, that sort of austerity when the whole house is, is really just not livable in again. Uh, and everything in it, all your possessions and all, all your memorabilia and, and all the stuff that you accumulated, all of that just uh, suddenly rotten to the core and useless. Um, it happens. Um, an earthquake happens. Uh, there can be all sorts of reasons why uh, all of a sudden we, we end up in a situation where effectively we have nothing. And, and it's a hard place to be where you do not know where your next meal is coming from. And here, Naomi lives with her husband in the town of Bethlehem, which means simply the house of bread. And how ironic she's thinking is that. In the very house of bread, there's no food at all, not even the most basic uh, commodities like that. And she's had to live through that, had to face that, had to handle that. And, and that's not easy. And as a result, they effectively emigrate. They go across to the land of Moab. And uh, that's a strange land, a foreign land. It's, it's not a place where the people of God uh, are called to be. It's, it's got a history as well. It's a, a different culture, a different people, different backdrop, and so on. And she has to go across to Moab. And it's a very isolating experience, that where your friends and your family are all back across the other side of the River Jordan or the other side of the Dead Sea, and uh, you are amongst people who you don't really know, uh, a different nationality, a different culture, a different background, a different story, a different perspective, a different outlook on things. And uh, it's a struggle to, to carry on in that sort of place, as uh, some of you uh, are familiar with. It's not easy being in a different culture, not easy being in a different country amongst a different people. However nice they may try to be, and however kind they may try to be, it's, it's not your people. It's, it's just a different place indeed. And she's been away for a lengthy period from family and friends. And on top of that, obviously, there is this um, bereavement that she's known. First her husband dies, and then her two sons die as well. And it's, it's again, hard, really, to, to begin to comprehend just how painful, how emptying that is, how desolating that is. Um, not just emotionally, although obviously emotionally and relationally, that's the biggest component in it, but in, in that society, that culture, um, that's also you're being deprived of, uh, of all your benefits, all the, uh, the, uh, the resources that you might have um, in, in terms of being provided for. The men in your life have simply been removed from you. And that's hard. Um, anyone who has been bereaved knows the pain, knows the ache, knows the, the void, uh, and knows how hard that is, and knows that tears do flow, um, often catching you unawares, and, and all of a sudden they just they come and they pour out because of the, the pain, the, the emptiness, 
that there has been in that individual and those individuals no longer being there. And, and that's her experience. It is a succession of circumstances in her lives that empty her of, of all that is dear to her. Uh, her land, her man, her sons, her hopes, her dreams, everything emptied. And it is striking for us the language that she uses, the Lord has brought me back empty. Uh, language that is picked up and used and applied to the Lord Jesus, who, though he was uh, God himself, did not count equality with God a thing to be held onto, but emptied himself. And emptied himself in a way that is even more expansive, even more uh, desolating and desperate than that which Naomi herself experiences here. And, and that's uh, in Philippians chapter 2 where Paul narrates that, that emptying of the Lord Jesus, uh, is said in a context where he's saying, no, that's, that's the pattern for all who will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you who are believers, that's how the chapter starts off. Uh, uh, I want you all, he says, to, to have this mind among you, to have this, this perspective, to take on board this pattern of living that is, uh, is revealed, is expressed supremely in the person of Jesus who emptied himself, becomes one of us, assumes the form of a servant and, and takes that to the extreme of death itself, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. That pattern whereby an empty himself and being thus ultimately crucified, he is then resurrected as well. Something happens. Something is released through that emptying of ourselves that releases a, a power of the living God. And Paul picks that up in 2 Corinthians where he speaks of, uh, of death being at work in us, but life in you through the emptying that goes on in our experience. God himself has a free channel to flow by his Holy Spirit through in such a manner that, that resurrecting, recreating power of the living God is released through our lives into the lives of others. And of course, that's, that's what is happening in Naomi's life because the only, the only way that this woman, Ruth, who, without spoiling the story, is going to marry Boaz, who's going to be the father of Obed, who's going to be the father of Jesse, who's going to be the father of David, way down the line, the only way Ruth is going to come into that place is because of something that she has seen in Naomi. Why, why will she follow Naomi back to the land of Israel? I mean, if this is what it is to be a believer, um, you, you are going to experience sorrow and loss and struggle and difficulty. If that's what it is to be a believer. Then, um, then her, you know, her, her sister-in-law is, is, is saying, yeah, you know, count me out. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm going to stick with Moab. Moab sounds like a kind of safer place than, uh, than what you're coming from. And, and the faith that you have and the religion that you have and the pattern of life that you have, uh, count me out, says her sister-in-law. But Ruth says, no, I, I, want, I want to go with you. And it is with Naomi. And I want to go where you go because I have seen something in you, even in adversity and perhaps especially in and through the adversity, I've seen something in you, the way that you are handling that, that rings bells and resonates with me and, and speaks to me of something that, that I want to know that as well. And you, you, you are able to see here something of what's involved in Naomi, that it, it is her faith, however weak and however compromised that faith may be, it has been nonetheless a very real faith in the Lord. And so she, she will say to her, her daughters-in-law that it is um, the Lord who has, uh, uh, the Lord's hand has turned against me. Uh, she is testifying to the reality of the living God. She's not pretending that it's easy, but she's testifying to him. And there is something about her that attracts Ruth. Something about the way that she handles adversity and sorrow and pain and suffering that draws Ruth to say, your God, he's going to be my God. I want him as my God. 
And your people, they're going to be my people. And where you go, I'm going there. And that's, that's powerful. But it's often, often, often in and through adversity and the way that we handle adversity, often in those times when we are emptied, that the Lord himself is, is kindling that faith in others around us as they look on and as they view it. We'll get that off. Thanks, Bruce. Um, it's not yours. No, I don't know whose it is. No. Yeah, we'll get, uh, get back to the, the passage, okay? Um, so don't be distracted um, because that's what, what the, the evil one would want to happen, right? Uh, he would want us to miss this, which is the culmination of what we've been on about. Uh, and that is her response, right? How you respond to this sort of adversity. Uh, this is what sowing in tears, in other words, looks like. And I want to suggest these two components to it, the first of which is repentance. Um, <clears throat> and you see what happens here, uh, this repentance on her part. And I'm going to, to lay some stress on this because I, I suspect under God that there is an element of this that, that maybe some of you here this evening need to address in your life. That this, this may be what the Lord is speaking to you about. Um, this becomes the pivotal moment in the ongoing expansive story of the people of Israel. It's not a, a kind of heralded moment that is always flagged up and gets the headlines, but it is the pivotal moment where Naomi goes back to the land of Israel in this manner. And the first part of that repentance is, is this. She left the place where she'd been living. This is not where, as a believer, she is meant to be. This is not where blessing is found. This is not where the life of faith is lived. Not the way she's been living. And so she will leave that place. Now, that needs to be applied by us to ourselves. Because sometimes we can be in a place, a kind of metaphorical place, where we shouldn't be. And it may be that there are places that you frequent that you need to stop frequenting. It may be that there are people whose company you keep that you need to stop keeping that company. It may be there are pastimes that you pursue that are not the pastimes that the Lord means you to be applying your energies and your time towards. It may be there is language that you use. And the Lord says, that's, that's not the place of blessing. The way that you speak to other people, the way you speak about other people, that's, that's not the place that you should be. And it may be you need to leave that place, leave those habits, leave the attitudes that you adopt because our attitudes can be a kind of place that we inhabit. We can inhabit the the, the land of resentment and quite enjoy living in that land. We can inhabit the land of envy and quite enjoy living in that land and get a peculiar pleasure from living in that land. God says that's not the place of blessing. It's not where you're meant to be. And repentance means that we, we leave the place where we are not meant to be. And at the start of a new year, the outset of a new year, 
Uh, it's an opportune moment for us to, to pause long enough to, to think about the, the priorities in our lives, the pattern of our living, and, and just to ask unto God, are, are, there, are there places that I should be leaving? And so she leaves on the one hand, and she leaves to return back home from there. Uh, she has been away for 10 years away from that place and that land where God is indeed king. She's been away from there for years. And that may be some of you. You've maybe, like her, been going through the motions. It may be like her that you have been at worship. It may be like her. You've kind of read the Bible. You say your prayers and things like that. But, but God is king where your whole life is, is brought under the lordship and the kingship of Jesus Christ and you live by him and for him in every single regard of your life. Uh, it may be you've been away from that place for years. It may be you drifted away uh, for years and, and you need to come back to that. Um, and the, the word that is used here, uh, that is used to translate this geographic, she returned, is a word in the Hebrew that, that uh, describes repentance. It is that sort of returning. It's not just a geographical returning, but it is a, a spiritual returning as well. Um, it's the word that gets used to describe that repentance. And it is used, you will see, if you look closely, um, although the, the English translation doesn't bring it out always, but it's used in verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 15, verse 16, verse 21, and verse 22, in order to underline how critical this is. She is going back to the Lord, however costly that may be. However difficult it may be for her, she will go back to the Lord. She's been brought to the point where she sees that where she is, the life that she has lived, the course that she has taken, is not how it's meant to be. And so she returns to the Lord. What will that look like for you in your life and the priorities that you adopt? I think you get a good picture of that in Acts chapter 2, where the, the new disciples there, uh, as they, they come to recognize the lordship of Jesus, uh, they, they join together with the other believers. And these are the priorities that they, they have in Acts chapter 2 at the end of the, the chapter there. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Um, that's quite a good description of what it is to return to the Lord. The devoting yourself to the apostles' teaching, the teaching of the scriptures, um, <clears throat> not just in a, um, a kind of uh, offhand sort of way, uh, come and going as you, you wish, but you devote yourself to that, to be one who is learning one who is being taught, taking every opportunity to be taught. You devote yourself to the fellowship. Uh, however difficult you may find that as an individual, you, you deliberately engage with other believers and you work at that. It's not always easy to engage with other believers, but you are, you are careful to engage as you are able. I know that some of you watching online, it's, it's no longer possible for you. And we, we love you dearly, and we would love to have you here, and we, we know that you would love to be here. But uh, should you be in a position to, to engage with other believers, you make that a priority. Uh, that's part and parcel of honoring the Lord Jesus Christ who, who came into this world, lived his life, died that death in order to bring us together. We, we give expression to that and engage with one another, commit ourselves to one another, seek to encourage, seek to support, seek to affirm one another as together we seek to serve him in that way. To the breaking of bread, that's the, the worship of God that finds its focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on our part. We, we gladly make sure that we are there in the place of worship and we give ourselves to prayer recognizing that he's king, recognizing that he is sovereign, that he does hear, that he does answer, that he is, is at work, work and, and we're glad to be a part of that. She returns in that manner. 
Um, <coughs> that's our repentance, and our repentance is matched by our faith. And I want you simply to notice as we close this about her faith. First of all, the honesty of her testimony. She doesn't pretend that she's fine when she comes back. And they say, wow, well, is, that, is that really the old name? She says, no, uh, don't call me that because that's not where I'm at. You ask what it's been like, it's tough and it's hard and, and it's been really, really better. And she doesn't pretend when they ask her, how are you, Naomi? She doesn't pretend, you know, I'm fine, I'm doing okay. She says, no, I'm, I'm struggling. I am, I am cut to the heart by all that has happened. It has hurt me desperately. And I'm, I'm a mess. She's, she's just very honest. And, and the Lord, as part and parcel of our faith, means that we are honest with him. Psalm 62, verse 8, or whatever it is, I think. Um, Trust in the Lord at all times, O people. Pour out your heart to him. For God is our refuge, is our safe place. Pour out your heart. Don't, don't, don't pretend that things are fine. Don't, don't, don't bring pious prayers with nice-sounding language to the Lord because you think that's what he wants to hear. You don't want to hear nice-sounding prayers. He's, he's got any number of different nice-sounding prayers. He's got a whole catalog of, of prayer books that he could follow. If he wants nice prayers being said to him, there's loads of stuff there that he can kind of easily resist. What he wants is your heart. And if your heart is hurting, he wants... He wants, he wants your, your heart poured, poured out to him. Pour out your heart to him. And, and that's, that's what Naomi does. The honesty of her testimony and then the integrity of her trust. If you look at uh, verses 21 and 22, uh, verses 20 and 21 rather, um, you'll see how um, four times over she has this reference to, to him as the Almighty and then he is the Lord, and then he is the Lord, and then he is the Almighty again. That's her testimony as she comes back. He is absolutely central. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very better. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And she is recognizing how much she does not and has not enjoyed the experience. She's recognizing that, that he's in it, that he's involved in it, that this somehow is in the providence of God. And she will not disdain the living God. She will not say, well, I, I don't want to know about this God. She's saying, no, that's his doing. And his hand is, I don't understand it, and I don't like it, and I don't enjoy it at all. But he is involved in this. His hand is on this. And she recognizes that that emptying has been a part of his doing. Emptying of her ambitions, emptying of her dreams, emptying of her resources, emptying of her self-reliance. She has been emptied by the Lord. And, and that's the starting point for what will be, in some ways, the most dramatic turnaround in the experience of a people that the scriptures record over the course of succeeding years. That's where it starts with this woman being thus emptied. And as I mentioned at the outset, um, they returned to Bethlehem as the harvest was beginning. And we're meant to understand that. Um, that as we live out our lives, and as the Lord does his work in us, and as we are emptied in one way or another, and that happens, uh, needs to happen to empty us of all our resources, all our gifts, all our ambitions, to empty us of everything in order that he may therefore live freely, fully through us. Then things happen. And as that happens, there is therefore then a harvest. And I come back to the words of Psalm 126, which for decades and decades have been a source of comfort and encouragement and strength to me. Verses 5 and 6, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. And that's a wonderful, wonderful picture 
that yeah, yeah the, the pain and the tears and the sorrows in the sowing as that word of God is, is sown in the experience of lives and perspective of others through the testimony that we bear in adversity. As we sow that seed with tears, God promises there will be asked. He takes that, he uses that, and we will return. Finally, the going in, coming in at the end, there will be that glad return in carrying our sheaves with us. That for which we have laboured and toiled, that for which our tears have watered, we will return with our sheaves in our arms. May God then bless his word to our encouragement tonight. Our Father, uh, thank you for the, the narrative here of this lady Naomi. Hard story for us to read when we enter into something of the pain and the anguish and the distress, the worry, the sorrow, the pain. And no wonder she described it as very, very bitter. Thank you for the encouragement you give to us that as in her life, you were pleased to be at work to do something way, way beyond what she could ever have asked or imagined. So you are pleased to this day for your people to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or even think through the power of your spirit within our hearts and lives. And, and if in order for that to be the case, that, that means we get empty, Lord, empty us, please. We don't want to get in the way of your work in the world today. We want to be channels of your grace, channels of your Holy Spirit's powerful working in the lives of others. And so if there are places that we need to leave, whether that's literal places or activities or attitudes, whatever it may be, if there are places we need to leave, Lord, would you help us? Would you grant that repentance to us whereby we, we leave that place and return to the land and the place of blessing, devoting ourselves to the teaching of your word, to the fellowship of your people, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Well, as our closing praise then, let's join to sing together uh, my, our days that God has numbered.
Go then in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.